We will now conduct our international speech contest. If you used your cell phone during the break, please ensure that it's on silent or that it's turned off. Once the contest has begun, the sergeant at arms will secure the doors. Members of the audience are asked to refrain from leaving or entering the room during the contest. After the contest, please do not leave the room until it's determined that all ballots have been collected. Please check to see that any devices such as your cell phones or pagers are turned off or pressed on silent. Here are the speaking order for the International Speech Contest. Contestant number one, Asia Osley. Contestant number one, Asia Osley. Contestant number two, Virginia Bosserman. Contestant number two, <coughs> Virginia Bosserman. Contestant number three, Shell Orkin. Contestant number three, Shell Orkin. Contestant number four, Dan Hickey. Contestant number four, Dan Hickey. Contestant number five, Eric Feinadagen. Contestant number five, Eric Feinadagen. Contestant number six, Sabil Ahmed. Contestant number six, Sabil Ahmed. We will proceed with the international speech contest. There will be one minute of silence between each contestant. Timekeepers, when I advise you to do so, please signal me with the green light when one minute is up. After all contestants have spoken, the judges will be given all the time they need to complete their ballots. Now begin the international speech contest with contestant number one, Asia Osley. <laughs> Unachievable identity. Unachievable identity. Asia Osley. society's definition of what beauty is, where you strive to reach an unachievable identity. Maybe you hoped and wished to be thinner, or buffer, or lighter, or tanner. Me personally, I've been dealing with becoming, with trying to become more healthy my entire life. I know I'll never be a size two or four, <laughs> and that's okay. <laughs> because I've never allowed this skewed vision of beauty to prevent me from knowing the beautiful person that I am. I had reinforcements my entire life. My parents always told me, be comfortable in the skin that you're in. And the truth is, this issue of unachievable identity is a prevalent cycle that's present in all stages of life. Childhood. We can all remember watching the Disney movies like The Little Mermaid and other princess movies where the main character, the symbol of beauty, was always thin in stature or they was in a bathing suit the entire time. Disney is actually under scrutiny right now because they have a healthy habits exhibit where the heroes are the small characters and the villains were the characters with the over-exaggerated body parts, insinuating to the children that that is bad. And who can forgive Barbie, the ultimate symbol of beauty? <laughs> now, if Barbie was a real person, she'd be 5'9", 39-inch bust, 18-inch waist, 33-inch hips, 
a size three shoe and 110 pounds. <laughs> and this is called a full fit. <laughs> Slumber Barbie was introduced that came with a bathroom scale permanently set at 110 pounds and a how to lose weight book with one direction and one direction only, simply reading, do not eat. <laughs> do not eat. Do you have any idea the millions of children that received this message that Barbie's key to being beautiful is not eating? The media and society is affecting these youth at a young age. Did you know that 42% of first through third graders are afraid of being fat? Look around this room, that's half of us. Did you know that 81% of 10 year olds want to be thinner? That's nearly all of us. The media and society is affecting them. Otherwise, where else are they getting these thoughts? I'm talking about your kids, your nieces, your nephews, your neighbors, your godchildren. They're all being affected. Teenagers. Oh, we can all remember having the posters of our favorite movie stars on the walls. We all wanted to be like the Madonnas, the Brad Pitts, the Beyonce's, Taylor Swift, the Nicki Minaj's. The society we live in now defines beauty as being tall and skinny like the models, or the voluptuous video girls with big butts and small waists that all the guys go crazy for. <laughs> This view is exactly why nearly a third of teenagers are bullied, or why teenage suicide is the third leading cause of death. Now, if only you, if only they knew that most of these ads are photoshopped, they want to spend their days <laughs> hoping to have this unachievable identity. This is the reason why anorexia and bulimia is introduced to us. 20% of anorexia and bulimia victims will die prematurely because of complications of the heart, organ failure, and suicide. <clears throat> That's one in five. Did you hear me? Teenagers, our future leaders are willing to die at the attempts and the pressures of becoming what society shows as being beautiful. Adults, oh yeah, we all know and are bombarded each day with fix, quick fix schemes everywhere. This diet, that diet, these pills, this shot, this drink, that, it's everywhere. The weight loss industry is a $55 billion a year industry. <laughs> Now it's one thing to be healthy, which is fine, but to use these quick fix schemes in an attempt to become what we think society looks at as being beautiful is one in our minds, it's one in our thoughts, it's one in our individuality. <clears throat> Why are we afraid of being ourselves? We need to teach ourselves and then teach the youth to love the unique person that they see. Because reaching for this unachievable identity, which is not a racist, because this false sense of beauty is prevalent in all ages, in all races, and in all communities. So when you're looking at that little one at night, and you're talking to your nieces and nephews, remember to tell them that beauty is only skin deep, and that it's what's beyond the surface that matters. Tell them to throw away the stereotypes because it's not about the beauty pageants, the entertainment industry, the modeling industry. It's about education and financial literacy and living and loving and laughing at life and striving to be the best they can be. Tell them that self-esteem and self-respect is not a function of age, size, or wealth. Tell them to breathe deep and be proud. I am me, I am unique, I am magnificent.
have one minute of silence while the judges mark their ballots. Contestant number two, Virginia Fosserman. <laughs> Boxes are everywhere. Boxes are everywhere. Virginia Fosserman. chose his addiction to alcohol over his family and ultimately drank himself into a coma, I had two small children 
to raise on my own. I was scared to death. The only way that I could move forward was to box everything up, put on that suit of armor so that nobody could hurt me or my children ever again. When you do that and you lock everything up and the crisis has passed or the children are grown, <laughs> you become part of your life and you have to do something purposely to unlock that. You have to step out of your comfort zone so that you can live, really live. Not like the movie Groundhog Day where every day is exactly like the day before. No. Then your life becomes more like Barbara Streisand and Funny Girl singing, I'm gonna live and live now. <laughs> Singing's optional. <laughs> healthy and exercising, doing that marathon, so that you can live to be 90 or 100. If you really stop living at 30 or 50 or 70, every day that we wake up is a good day. It's a gift, a gift that expires and no one knows when their last day on earth will be. Yet we go through life like we have all the time in the world. Like we will live forever. And we won't. So I encourage you, start getting involved in real life with real people have genuine relationships and conversations. Step out of your box, do something different, get involved. It's those relationships that give us the joy in our lives. Those are the memories that we cherish forever. And always remember, life is a gift. But it does not come wrapped in a box. We're the ones who box things up, little by little. Because we were scared. Because we were hurt. Because we thought we were too old to do some things anymore. <laughs> if you're still alive, you're not too old to really live. So think about it. Go dig out your box and discover what's in your box. Madam Toastmaster. May we have one minute of silence while the judges mark their ballots. Contestant number three, Shell Orkin. <laughs> Little things. Little things. Shell 
Orkin. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, distinguished guests, and friends. It's the little things that are really important in life. It's the little things that matter. I believe that. How many here believe that? Good. Let me give you an example. One day, about two months ago, I was walking down to my basement, and I got to the bottom step, and a delightful surprise hit me. I looked down, and I saw the most exquisite, handsome man that I've ever seen. It's a reflection of me. <laughs> and I knew that I didn't have a mirror on the floor. I had carpet. And I look over into the corner, and I see the crest of the wave. That <laughs> And there was water all over the place. My basement was flooded. <laughs> wow. You know, many people in their basement, sitting though in that dirty, filthy corner, have something called a sump pump. And that sump pump is designed to keep your basement dry. And if you're a scout, you may have a battery backup because you want to be prepared. And you know what? I'm an Eagle Scout. I have an extra pump, three pumps, that I have because I want to be prepared. And every year I take the battery back up to be serviced, and this year was no exception. I look down, and there's three inches of water. What's three inches look like? Well, if you hold up your finger, from here to here is three inches. Huh, what can three inches do? Not that much water, right? It lifted up the tile, it ruined the padding in 400 square feet, it ruined the carpet, and it ruined the walls on the side. So now, I take my floaties, and I put them on my feet, and I blow up my arm waders, and I go walking to the sump pump. And I walk over, and sure enough, the sump pump stopped working. And the backup didn't work. So I take, I have a third pump, right? So I take the window that's in the basement, I have a big pool hose, and I go to take and take the window out so I can put the hose in there, and, and the glass breaks. And now I have shards of glass all over everywhere. And I go to plug in this pump, and I go to lean over and plug it in, and I get shocked, the shock of my life. Duh, you don't stand in water and plug in an electrical outlet, you know? So, I stand back, and I wait for my heart to get back into the rhythm. And I look over my body for all the charred marks. And I'm now, I get a wooden stool out, I climb up on it, wooden stool, doesn't conduct. And I plug in the sump pump, and sure enough, the water recedes. Well, afterwards, now I'm a broken man, I'm electrocuted, I'm wet, and I'm angry. And I take my pump, and I go to the backup people who serviced it, and I walk in there, and I wait for the guy to come to the counter. And I said, sir, do you know that Webster, Miriam Webster in the seventh edition, defines backup as a person, a place, or a device that's used in reserve as an alternative and I had a flood in my basement, and it didn't work, and it didn't serve me. So he starts clicking away and tapping away at the computer, and he says, oh, yes, sir, you were in here, and, you know, we replaced your deep cycle battery not too long ago, and we changed your float switch, and we added a controller. And I lift up my pump, and I said, did you check the backup pump? Well, no, we didn't. He says, they never go bad. <laughs> I said, never? Really? Please check it. So he goes back, in 15 minutes he comes back, and he says, well, the pump is bad. The pump is bad. But don't worry, we'll replace it for you. No charge, we'll replace it. I said, how about my flooded basement? He says, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> And he walks and shrugs away. And I'm thinking, you know what's important to me is, you would think that what's really important to me is I didn't get cut with all the glass that broke. You would think that I had this other backup sump pump, that that would really be great. You would think that insurance 
paid for most of this flood, you think that would really be great. But you know, it's, it's the little things. It's the little things that matter most. It's the little things that mean the most to you. And you know what? The greatest thing was, he apologized. <laughs> <laughs> May we have one minute of silence while the judges mark their ballots. Contestant number four, Dan Hickey. When life throws you a curve, when life throws you a curve Dan Hickey. Go for your dreams. Reach for the stars. Don't let anyone stop you. You hear motivational speakers say that all the time, right? I do too, and I agree with them. However, I want to add one thing. When you go for your dreams, you not only have to be determined, but you have to be flexible. Because sometimes, life throws you a curve. Madam Toastmaster, dignitaries, fellow Toastmasters, and you future Toastmasters, <laughs> I grew up in a baseball family in a baseball city Chicago. Hey, we were Southsiders and we were diehard White Sox fans, okay? In our family, we all loved to play the game. And we had one standout. That's right. You're not looking at him. <laughs> My brother Jim. Jimbo was a standout from the start. This guy always wanted to be in the majors and play in the World Series. And he pursued that dream. When Jimbo was a junior in high school, they played the city championship in, the, in Sox Park, Old Comiskey Park, and this skinny little kid hit a home run over the left field wall. Not bad for a junior. Led his team to the city championship. When he was in college, NCAA, University of Texas, he had the best record in the NCAA and became All-American. So on draft day, we were so excited. We were all waiting in anticipation, the whole neighborhood, to see where Jim was going to get picked. And? Holy cow, the Chicago White Sox select Jim Hickey. My brother was on the White Sox. Time to dance. My brother's on the White Sox. My brother's on the White Sox. I know that was inappropriate and I apologize, but we were so excited. And Jimbo played for the Sox for a couple years, but then life threw him a curve. And they traded him to the uh, Astros. Well, he stuck with the Astros, and he started single A, he worked hard, double A, triple A. When he got to triple A, that arm started to hurt, and then pretty soon it became apparent that he wasn't going to make the major leagues, that he wasn't going to play in the World Series. A dream-killing curveball, right? Well, the Astros thought he had a good head on his shoulders, and they offered him a coaching position. He thought about it for about two seconds and said yes, because he stuck with the game he loved, and he dealt with it. Well, he started again, single A, double A, triple A, and when he got to triple A a few years later, he said to the manager of the team and to the owner of the team, hey, I would love to coach the Astros in the major leagues. But Drake McLean, Texan and big Texas accent said to him, well, Jim, y'all ain't never gonna coach the uh, Astros because you gotta have major league experience. That's a must around here. A career limiting curveball, right? But you know what? Something was about to change. 
In mid-season 2004, the highly favored Astros were struggling. They were under 500. And that owner, same guy with the big Texas accent, he was so frustrated, he got the broom out and fired the whole entire coaching staff. He brought in a new guy from out of retirement called Phil Garner, named Phil Garner. And he said, Phil, who do you want for coaches? Phil said, just give me the AAA guys. Oh, wait, hold, out, hold the phones, folks. Who was the AAA coach at this time? <laughs> my brother, time to dance again. My brother's in the majors. My brother's in the majors. I was so excited. We were all so excited, the whole neighborhood. And, uh, but I tell you, <clears throat> life threw us all a big curveball because a couple of months earlier, my dad, Jim Sr., one of my brother's biggest fans, lost his battle to cancer. And um, that was tough. Well, I don't know if he had anything to do with it, but those Astros caught fire. They began to chase the wild card. And they won the wild card, and they went all the way to the National League Finals. It was such a good performance that they renewed my brother's contract for a year. So now he was a real coach with a contract. The next year, 2005, mid-season, they were chasing the wild card again. At the same time, the Sox were in first in the American League Central. I remember thinking to myself at the time, wouldn't it be strange if the Sox played the Astros in the World Series? Who would I root for? And I thought, ah, when pigs fly. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know what happened if you follow baseball. When they met in the World Series, I was afraid to go outside because if pigs could really fly, they could get very messy. <laughs> so so uh, I had a moral dilemma. Life threw me a curveball, right? I had to choose between the Astros, my brother's team, and the White Sox. Who do I root for? Well, you know that old saying, blood is thicker than Lake Michigan water? <laughs> and that and my brother got me tickets to the game. So go Astros! <laughs> That felt so weird that I had to go to counseling for months afterwards. <laughs> well, let's talk about the World Series for a second. We all hopped on the train to get the full experience. Everybody on the train, they're riding the train, and they're swapping stories about how they got their tickets. It was like they won the golden ticket to Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory. <laughs> uh, when we got off the train, cell one was a madhouse. We follow the crowd up into the park, and it was electrifying. You know, that World Series atmosphere is so amped up, it's hard to describe. Well, anyway... I look down uh, on the field, and there he is, my big brother, throwing batting practice in the major leagues, in a major league park, in the World Series, Sox Park. Wow, dream achieved, right? Yeah. What happened next was Josh Groban came out to sing the national anthem. What a voice. When he did this, servicemen and women unfurled a huge flag that stretched from line to line, and they began to wave it. Oh, I got chills. After that, the game was awesome and intense. The Sox won by one run, and when they did, that old scoreboard with the pinwheels blew up and started spewing fireworks like it was the 4th of July, and Chinese New Year all rolled into one. After the game, I got to go down to the field, down to the clubhouse. I got to meet Ozzie Guillen, get a picture with him. It was great. I finally got to see my White Sox win a World, or win a World Series game. But I was rooting for the other team, WT, fill in the blank. <laughs> well, I was most happy for my brother, Jim. He dealt with his setbacks and his curveballs, and he made it because he stuck with the game he loved. My mother, who could barely afford it, got this great seat behind home plate to see her son in, the, in a World Series game. And you know what I think? I think that my dad smiled from somewhere way above the nosebleed section. That's what I think. So, it's all said and done. Yes, pursue your dreams. Go for your dreams. Reach for the stars. Don't let anyone stop you. But be flexible, because life's going to throw you a curveball. You know what? Enjoy the game. Madam Toastmaster. Go Cubs. May we have one minute of silence while the judges mark their ballots.
contestant number five, Eric Feinedagen. <laughs> the new normal. The new normal, Eric Feinedagen. of the present, with our hopes and dreams of the future. Or in other words, we're just plain busy. <laughs> and we might be able to juggle this for a while, but eventually, we're all going to drop the ball. As we reach down to pick up that ball, sometimes we can lose our balance. And our juggling act can quickly turn into a drama. So the question is, how do we find our balance? Now to get an answer to this deep and philosophical question, I decided to turn to a higher power. This is a power that is much greater than my own, and I know will always be there for me. This power, of course, are my 300 friends on Facebook. <laughs> As you can imagine, I didn't get the answer up <laughs> So I decided to meet with a business coach named Dan. It was 10.28 on a Tuesday morning. I was having breakfast with Dan. He looks at me and says, Eric, balance begins in your mind. He said, think of it like a scale. You need to offset the experiences of your past with the opportunity for more in the future. Or in other words, you need to let go to grow. I sat there in silence. And a wave of fear came over me when I heard those words. Because whether it's a bad habit or a negative relationship, raise your hand if you've ever had to let go of something before. <laughs> it can be scary, right? Because when we let go, we lose control. But he reassured me. He went on to say, we need to get rid of the junk and debris that builds up in our minds, that weighs us down, and keeps us out of balance. We must get rid of the what ifs, the doubts, the failure mentality to create room for more success and to find our true joy. So the question I ask you today is, are you out of balance? And is there something that you need to let go of? Could there be something in your past that's not allowing you to fully find your joy in the present? It reminds me of a story of a young girl who was born into poverty in the Deep South. Despite the fact that she grew up in meager surroundings and she was abused by members of her family, she made a decision that she was going to make a difference one day. So she enrolled in a university and made a commitment that she was going to positively impact the lives of others. She fulfilled that commitment so much that today she's known by one name. Oprah. She has admitted in her autobiography that because she was willing to let go of the negative experiences of her childhood, that she was able to find her balance and create her new normal. She has been quoted as saying, we become what we dwell on. So again, I ask you, is there something that you need to let go of? You know, it takes me back to my own journey in the past that I took in pursuit of my own dreams. I remember the first road I went down, I wanted to play professional basketball in the NBA. <laughs> oh, 
it's okay to laugh. Because at five feet, eight inches tall, all right, fine, five feet, six and three quarters, but it's gonna be track. I faced many obstacles. And that goal became dream roadkill. So then I started another journey. I wanted to be CFO of a Fortune 500 company. So I went along, I went along that journey, had some success, but you know what? Other people wanted to be CFO too. So I hit more obstacles. And that aspiration became dream roadkill. Not wanting to give up, I decided to try one more time. I wanted to own my own business. I was so excited. But guess what? Hit more obstacles. More dream roadkill. So like most people, I picked up my broken dreams and I carried them with me. It wasn't until I heard those encouraging words from Dan that I was willing to let go of those broken dreams, regain my balance, and open myself up to new ones, thus creating my new normal. So I'd like to leave you with this. If your life becomes a juggling act, just remember that sometimes we need to let go to find our balance. And what's interesting, if you juggle the letters in balance, you take a C, an A, and an N, and an A, a B, an L, and an E, you'll notice that you can, and you're able to create your new normal. Madam Toastmaster. One minute of silence while the judges mark their ballots. Contestant number six, Seville Ahmed. <laughs> Lessons learned from Toastmasters. Lessons learned from Toastmasters, Seville Ahmed. The time was 6.30 and I was getting late for a very, very important meeting. So I told to my wife, come on, we are getting late, my two kids, come on, let's go to the meeting. So as we were driving to the meeting, I had a little paper in my hand, I was shaking as I was reading and I was driving. I'm not trying this at home, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> we went to the Martin Grove Public Library. We opened the door up there and we saw 25 wonderful people sitting up there and they were calling out the names. Speaker number one, speaker number two, speaker number three. Madam Toastmaster, my fellow Toastmasters, esteemed guests, especially my mom who's sitting up there in the back. <laughs> this was my very first Toastmasters meeting where I was supposed to give my icebreaker speech. <laughs> so when they called out my name, I was literally shivering with fear. As I went up to the podium, I held to the podium with the paper in the front, and I started to speak. My life is a blessing from God. <laughs> <laughs> After I finished my speech, I don't know, time was for eternity. After I finished my speech, everyone started to clap. I looked at my wife in the back, I said, wow, what did I do here? <laughs> <laughs> when we went back home, I spoke to my wife and they told me, 
You know, these people, these are wonderful liars. <laughs> <laughs> but I love them. That's what they mean. So the very first lesson that I learned from being a Toastmaster is that to inspire people, to motivate people, to keep, uh, and to keep them going, no matter how good or bad that they were. So being into Toastmaster, in the next few months, I was able to complete my 10 speeches. So now I'm a competent Toastmaster. <laughs> as I was gaining more confidence as being a Toastmaster, I received a call from one of the mosques in Gary, Indiana, saying that, Sabil, we really need your help. Our person who's supposed to give the sermon is not able to make it. Can in two days, can you prepare a sermon and come and help us out? I said, fine. I have two days to prepare. So I prepared the sermon on the topic of the guidance from the Holy Scriptures. I prepared the sermon. I practiced with my wife. I was practicing within myself. I went to Gary, Indiana. Again, as I was driving, I have this paper in front of me. <laughs> I went there safely. As I opened the door, there were 300 individuals sitting up there waiting for me. I went to the stage, went up on the stage, sat down there with the paper in my hand. The administrator, he got up and he said, here is Mr. Sabin Ahmad, and he's going to give a presentation on the projects that he's doing as part of his uh, uh, association. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> I stood up and I gave the presentation, connecting with the people and giving them the things that we are doing as part of the organization that I belong to. Everyone loved the presentation. I was getting more confident this time. I received a call from my president of my company. He said, you know, Sabine, I heard that you're part of the Toastmasters and you know that we have a fundraiser coming up. And we raised $60,000 last year. I want you to be a presenter and give a 10-minute speech on the things that we are doing as part of our association. I said, fine, I will take the challenge. I have two months to prepare, so I prepared for the presentation. As me and my wife, as we went and opened the door, lo and behold, not 50 people, not 300 people, there were 800 people sitting in the room. How <laughs> <laughs> a challenge for me. Even though I was nervous, when I looked at the stage, I was very happy. You know, I'm a short guy. I stopped growing when I was 12 years old. <laughs> The reason I was happy was the podium was as high as I was. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to the podium next to it and I was standing behind the podium, right? People were peeking from this side, some from this side, some were going like this. Why is this guy disappeared? <laughs> At that point, I was reminded of a very important point that my Toastmasters gave me. Sabiel, let go of the podium. <laughs> let go of the podium. Come to the front. Connect with the audience. Maybe give them a high five. <laughs> Use your voice. Connect. No barriers in the middle. So I gave a presentation for about 10 minutes, and that fundraiser, we were able to raise $150,000. Oh, wow. <laughs> Now, my dear Toastmasters, it is not about how good that we do between the four walls of our Toastmasters meeting. It is not about how many trophies that we win. Right? Can I take one, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> it is about how we take the tools and techniques from here, the leadership techniques, the competent communicators techniques, and how we enhance ourselves to become a good human being a good father, a good mother, a good child, 
a good neighbor. And taking the tools and techniques from here and enhancing the world out there, bringing the much needed justice and peace in the world. That's, that's what the biggest lesson that I learned from being a Toastmaster. So that night after the fundraising dinner, right, after the fundraising dinner, I was using all of these tips and techniques about storytelling and podium and all of these topics. I came and I checked with my wife. How did I do on my presentation? She started to clap like this. <laughs> I said, no, not that kind of clapping. That reminds me of my icebreaker speech when they were clapping like that. <laughs> At the same time, my daughter, she ran up to me and she said, Abuji, Daddy, you gave the best speech of your life. You were connecting with everyone. I was able to understand everything. So I said, Zainab, thank you very much. My dear Toastmasters, for the wonderful gifts that you have given me, thank you very much. Everyone, please remain silent for the judges to complete their ballots. And the ballots have been collected by the ballot counter. Madam Toastmaster, we have all the ballots. Okay, so let's get to know our contestants. Will all the Table Topics contestants please come on stage?
Billy Dave, will you share with us how long you've been in Toastmaster and which club are you representing? Sure, I represent club number 3855, the Allstate Speakeasies Toastmasters group. Woo -hoo! I've been a Toastmaster for two years with that club and one year before that with another club that I was a part of. Great. And you say here in your bio that you recently completed your CL? I did. I did. I'm so excited about that. Toastmasters, and which club are you representing? I, I start with uh, 5577, all American speakers in uh, June, what was it? February, February of this year. I've been a Toastmaster earlier, I'm in two clubs, so oh. I'm here to represent 5577 today. Okay. And what's your educational level? Uh, advanced Communicator Browns and Advanced Leader Browns. Now, you said that you haven't accomplished anything of significance. That's right. Okay, well, what about being here today? <laughs> All right, well, we'll kind of. Okay. <laughs> I'll take my pile of hearts. Okay. <laughs> Deborah, which club are you representing, and how long have you been in Toastmasters? I'm a club at Toastmasters, you are at Undivided Labs, and I've been in it for about a year. Great. And what's your educational level? I just completed my CC and work now. Robert, how long have you been in Toastmaster, and which club are you representing? Well, I'm representing Baxter's Toastmasters, club number 2447, I do believe. Woo, Baxter! Yeah. Yeah. I've personally been with uh, the Baxter Club for about two years, just a little over two years. I just understood I just had my anniversary recently, so right. I'm excited to be here. Great. And how, what is your educational level? I'm still working on my CC. Okay. So a couple more speeches to go. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. How did you survive two daughters? <laughs> well, you know, two daughters, it, it's uh, two daughters and a wife. I'm, and, and <laughs> <laughs> severely outnumbered at home. <laughs> but I have found, you know, and, and I think it's every parent when, you know, when, when the baby's on the way, and, and guys would never admit this, and I'm sure the women wouldn't either, but, you know, you want a healthy, happy child. But the guys are always kind of rooting for the for a boy. And the girls are always kind of rooting for a little girl. I was rooting for a boy. I, I gotta admit, but as it stands right now, I couldn't think of life any other way. As a matter of fact, being a father of, of two little girls and being in the center of the world is probably one of the most rewarding things in my life. <laughs> club you're representing and how long have you been in Toastmasters? I'm with the Figures of Speech Toastmasters Club 1856, which is the Granger Company Club. I've been a continuous member of that club for 15 years. And what is your educational level? I'm an advanced communicator bronze and an advanced leader bronze. Great. How do you encourage members to take the next step? Well, the way that I start with encouraging members to take the next step is let them know that they can do it. An example of that would be four years ago, we had a new member, and I encouraged her to become an assistant, not take on the, the real role, Vice President of Education, and today she's our division governor. Oh, wow. <laughs> Which club are you representing, and how long have you been in Toastmasters? Club number 6244, Clark of Lincolnshire. I've been in the club for about nine years. Thank you. Thank you. And please share with everyone your educational level. I am a distinguished Toastmaster. Yeah. And can you also share with us a little bit about your involvement with the Boy Scouts? I've been a scout leader for as long as I can remember. Like Shell, Shell's an Eagle Scout. I am not, but my son is. That's the most proudest moment in my life. In fact, during his Eagle Corps of Honor, in the speech he gave to the, to the troop, one of his phrases was, I'm an Eagle Scout, my dad's not. That was one of the proudest moments of my life. 
He has something he can hold over my head his whole entire life. He played Eagle, I did not. So I've got to see that for a lot of years. I really enjoyed it. Speech contestants, please come up on stage. I said, that would be a great thing to do. And I went up to him and I said, can you teach me? And he says, yeah, I work at the, at the uh, Mexican cafe on Sunday nights and come by and after I'm finished, we'll twist some balloons. <laughs> and uh, I went down there and he started teaching me how to twist. And now I do uh, my grandkids' birthday parties and all that, and tracks and swords. And I have the belt and then all the balloons and the pump. It's really a lot of fun. Can you come to my house? <laughs> <laughs> Dan, how long have you been in Toastmaster and which club are you representing? All state speakeasies, seven years. And let me just say, Mel Brooks, right? <laughs> <laughs> and what's your educational level? I have my competent communicator, my competent leader. I'm working on my advanced communicator and advanced leader, Ron. <laughs> Share with us a little bit what you did to re-energize a dying club. Well, to re-energize a dying club, I was blessed. Um, I was elected president in my absence. <laughs> the club was horrible. Nobody was there. Two or three people at, at meetings. But um, 
I said, okay. I started spreading the word. I got blessed with a couple of really good people sitting in this audience who came in and said, I want to work, I want to do something. And so the three of us just started hammering it out and talking to people and having meetings and having rules and having procedures. And next thing you know, it got attractive and people started to join. So we're, we're the fastest growing uh, group at Allstate and probably in our area. Eric, which club are you representing and how long have you been in Toastmasters? Lake County Toastmasters, 652972, about eight years. Wow. And what's your educational level? I'm a CL in Advanced Toastmaster Silver. Okay. Soon to be AL. Soon to be AL. <laughs> now, you say here that being a dad is probably one of the best things that's happened to you? Yes. What? Um, like the other gentleman, I do not have two daughters, but I have a son and a daughter. And it's taught me more in the last four years than I have in you know, <laughs> the last right. 35. There right. you go. Right. Yeah, bad, 35. So it's taught me a lot. And like you said, it's just a joy. Thank you. Thank you. which club are you representing and how long have you been in Toastmasters? I'm representing two clubs actually, the SEG club and the Miles club. <laughs> uh, about a year and a half. Great. And what's your educational level? I'm done with my CL. And going for uh, the bronze. Now, you mentioned here something about a Rubik's Cube. Can you share with everyone your accomplishment? <laughs> As I was growing up in India, I was very much addicted to the Rubik's Cube. Some of you heard about that, right? <laughs> <laughs> now, I found out one day in a magazine that the fastest person who did the Rubik's Cube in India was five minutes. So I took up the challenge. <laughs> Let me try to beat that record. So after practicing day after day, week after week, I was able to accomplish in two minutes, 39 seconds. Oh, wow. wow. The last half of it blindfolded. Wow. <laughs>
We need some drums. First contest, table topics. Our third place winner. Please welcome Steve Survey. to all the contestants. You did a wonderful job today. Thank you for uh, everybody who helped. Thank you for all the vegetarians here today. Thank you for all the vegetarians. This contest is now adjourned. Thank you, everyone. And there were 85 people in attendance. <laughs>
85 people in attendance. Can all the winners please come up to the front so we can get your pictures taken? All the winners please come up to the front so you can have your pictures taken.